Hello, welcome to another edition of the Pace Report. I'm Brian Pace reporting live here at Joe's Pub here in New York City. Trombonist, vocalist, and band leader Natalie Cressman tonight is performing selections off her brand new record, Turn to See, which is her second CD. And this album is totally different from her debut record, Unfolding. In fact, Unfolding really introduced the music world not only to this young jazz trombonist, but also where she wants to move musically. This new record really showcases all of her musical influences, ranging from folk, indie rock, jazz, R&B, and funk, and it's backed by her band, The Secret Garden. We sat down early and we talked about the origins of her growing up in San Francisco. We talked about her musical family, her mother and father, as well as talk about the direction of jazz trombone and vocal as where she sees it musically. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the sounds of Miss Natalie Cressman, live here for a record release party here at Joe's Pub, here on The Pace Report here in New York City. Natalie, congratulations on your brand new CD, Turn to See. This is your second CD, and this album is really showcasing everything. You're the vocalist, you're the band leader, you're the trombonist. How hard and how easy was it for you to do what we call the second sophomore jinx record? <laughs> uh, well, you know, it actually wasn't as hard as I thought it was going to be. The songs kind of came out came pouring out pretty easily and pretty soon after my first album came out. 
Um, and it was kind of freeing to get to call the shots because I do so much work as a sound man that, I mean, uh, sorry, as a side man. Um, it's hard to, um, you know, always feel like you can put your fullest self into the music because you're kind of trying to fit what you're doing in alignment with, you know, the person's vision, whoever's leading the band. So I kind of got to be that person. Um, and for that, it was kind of easy to um, follow through on my own vision in this um, album. Um, and yeah, I mean, I didn't really think of it as being a Jinx record. I just kind of took it in a different direction and kind of let the, the lyrics and the story be the starting point and went from there. You know, everyone says the the second, because your first record was really, it showcased really all of your jazz chops. Mm -hmm. But every musician has to go through that second record because it's like we have to do better than the first one. And this record is a lot better than your first one because this is a little more outside of the box music wise there's different types of music influences yeah um, definitely I mean I kind of took what I had been listening to in the singer-songwriter vein and the indie rock vein and kind of fused that with my jazz background and so you know obviously I, I have come very far as a musician in two years but it's also you know my so approach to writing music has changed so much and so the process of writing these songs was completely different and kind of based around the vocals, so that kind of shifted it. Speaking of vocals, which is really the stand out of, in addition to your trombone playing, singing, you're doing two, actually three disciplines in addition to the band leadership. That's got to be completely hard because, I mean, trombone is what you're, you're training, but you're doing another vocal. Uh, yeah, the, well, for me, the voice, like, you know, my inner voice is kind of connected on trombone or voice. Um, but definitely, like, kind of owning the frontman position as a singer is really different. And so I kind of just, it's nice to have the, the freedom to, like, write music and melodies that kind of suit my voice and what I do well. Um, so that kind of gave me a sense of comfort because I was really in charge of what I was going to do vocally. Um, but, you know, uh, I think that they're really related. I think the way that I play trombone and, you know, it wouldn't be that same way if I didn't sing and vice versa. So I think that's kind of what is reflected on the album is that they're kind of connected.
know, Karen Carpenter was a drummer and a vocalist, and she was an incredible drummer, just as you are an incredible trombone player. Is it easier to sing, or is it harder to play trombone? Hmm, it, it's probably, I think it's harder to sing in certain ways, um, in that it's very bare bones, it's very, it it's kind of puts you in a very vulnerable place, because sometimes I feel like I have the luxury of kind of hiding behind the trombone as my medium, but when you're a singer, it's like your yourself is the medium, and so um, getting comfortable with that and not being intimidated by letting, you know, your roots show, so to speak, in singing, that was definitely an adjustment. Um, but honestly, the more and more that I sing, the easier it feels compared to playing the trombone because sometimes having a hunk of metal on your face over the course of a night can be really tiring and technically demanding. And sometimes I find singing to be a lot free, more freeing and easy. So it goes both ways. <laughs> who are some of your vocal influences and who are some of your trombone influences? Because we're going to go into the jazz part of this in just a minute. Mm -hmm. but it seems like you have really kind of incorporated a lot of the folk type singers into your vernacular. Yeah, well my favorite probably of all time is Joni Mitchell um, and I keep going back to her as like my it's co compositional and vocal influence um, but also people that are kind of on the scene now like Becca Stevens and Gretchen Parlato and Esperanza Spaulding um, other and Saint Vincent is another one in kind of the indie side of things. She's a great singer. And right? yeah, and Emily King um, is one of my favorites. Um, I've been really checking her out over the last couple of years. So those are kind of the main influences I would kind of off the top of my head for uh, vocals. And then for trombone, um, I kind of go f as far back as J.J. Johnson and Frank Rosalino. But um, kind of think you know the way that I play. I think also. Um, Josh Roseman had a big impact on me as a trombonist and kind of his very melodic style of playing and um, and also he has such a unique style of playing and so finding you know my way of being unique I feel like you know I, I used to play next to him in um, Peter Affelbaum's New York Hieroglyphics Ensemble and I think kind of getting to watch him in those early stages of my career really helped me kind of latch on to the fact that it's you know it's good to check out you know trombonists from all throughout this music's history, but also to put yourself into it and find what you do well in your own sound.
putting a contemporary twist to the trombone because there have been some extremely important trombone players on the jazz as well as the R&B side, ranging from Fred Wesley to Jack Teagarden. Mm -hmm. Tell me what made you drawn to this instrument because this is a very, very hard instrument to play along with the trumpet. Yeah, um, well, I guess I'd have to say that growing up watching my dad play and having there be that trombone around the house must have had an effect on it, um, on my choice to play the trombone, um, and kind of the mellowness and the and the warmth of the sound, and and also how um, it can be so vocal in nature because you know without valves or keys, it's that the inflections are are more like that of the human voice. So I think that's part of what really drew me to the trombone. You've been playing this instrument since you were about seven or eight years old. Yeah, I think eight or nine. I was, my arms had to be long enough to reach seventh position. Um, but yeah, I started um, when I was about eight or nine, and my dad was my first teacher. And um, I had a, a girlfriend who picked up the trombone at the same time, and we studied with my dad together. Really See, so you were like the Lisa Simpson of your... Yes, <laughs> I really identify with her 100% in so many ways. <laughs> you know this this is interesting because your your mother and your father as you said are very very important musicians your father plays with Santana and he's also an engineer he engineered both your records mm -hmm. and your mom is a famous Brazilian singer so music pretty much was in your DNA uh, it was I mean it, yeah it was always we always were playing music together and I kind of got to glimpse that sense of community you know that the music world has and it's um, you know it was very captivating to me and I wanted to you know become part of it at a certain point but it also wasn't forced down my throat which I think was also helpful because sometimes when parents like force music on their kids it has the opposite effect so I was glad that they were you know supportive of, of it but didn't force me to you know practice eight hours a day you know. <laughs> Trey Anastasio is another important affiliation that you're part of. You are part of his band. You've been playing with him for a while. Tell me how you guys met and tell me what it's like playing with a guy who's made an important impact to rock music. Um, well, we met, basically, he tried to hire my dad first and my dad was busy um, on tour with Santana. And so my dad kind of threw my name in the hat and said, you know, he, you know, knew that I could probably do a good job. Um, and so I actually got hired before I even met Trey. Um, and then we had a, a week of uh, vocal and horn rehearsals before the, even the full band came together. And that's kind of when I really got, it, got a chance to get to know him. Um, and I guess he's had so many, he's had such a big influence on me in so many ways. Um, because of the way that he really freely melds so many styles together in his music. And, and you know, a lot of those Fish songs are so intricate and involved and unique. And yet, you know, you know, the audience really embraces it in a big way. And so, you know, getting to play with him was like a really great affirmation that, you know, it's okay to, you don't have to dumb down your music for anyone. You know, there has, you know, you can reach these people, you know, in, in certain ways and still keep that complexity and that the surprise element in music, which I sometimes feel is lacking in popular music. Um, so I think that was a big influence and also his crazy, amazing energy and work ethic that he just brings every day, you know, a smile on his face and, and boundless energy to make great music, so. They say it's time to move on.
you were from San Francisco and you made your way to New York City by way of the Manhattan School of Music. What is it that you studied there and what was it that you wanted to achieve when you got here to New York? Uh, well, I was there studying jazz trombone. Um, that was my main focus. And I think I moved to New York because it is kind of, there's, you know, the cream of the crop here in a lot of ways. And I felt that way about music schools as well. That um, if I, you know, moved to New York, I'd be studying with some of the, the top people that were also in my peer group. So getting to learn from the people that were around me in class was really great. And I think for me, I, I came up from such a unusual musical background. You know, my parents are really involved in a lot of world music, and and um, and then through that, I got in touch with jazz. Um, going to a conservatory like Manhattan School of Music kind of helped me fill in the blanks. Like I didn't really come across a ton of bebop growing up in California, um, um, and so getting to go to a school that's you know very structured about the jazz tradition kind of helped me fill in those blanks when I moved here. You know, because you, you, like I said, your palate is so heavy. I mean, when you were in your teens, you were playing with Pete Escovito. And, you know, you're playing with greats like Nicholas Payton. And what has your musicianship, or where has your musicianship grown in the last five or six years since you've been here? Mm, I mean, I think, oh, that's such a, a big topic. I Well, I would have to say that, I mean... I think definitely in terms of harmony and theoretical stuff, I've come a long way in the last five years because of that. Um, but also I think kind of learning how to be a chameleon of different styles and really kind of doing your homework and trying to you know fit into a sound. I think that's really important and you know horn players are very versatile in that you know it's, it's you know one night I might be playing with a funk band, the next night it's avant-garde, and then you know a New Orleans brass band, and it's all kind of connected. But it all there's all these unique elements that it's worth you know really checking out and really being able to incorporate those inflections and those nuances. So kind of learning how to be a chameleon in styles was really um, I think one of the big things I learned when moving to New York. That'll do it again for another edition of the Pace Report, reporting live here at Joe's Pub here in New York City. I'd like to personally thank the talented Natalie Crespin for her time, as well as the staff and management here at Joe's Pub for their warm hospitality. As always, please visit my website, www.thepacereport.com, for my weekly column as well as my past segments. Until next time, remember if it's in the groove, it'll make you move. Till next time, peace.